Today on Blue 58, the Packers stumbled out of the gate and nearly let Baltimore come all the way back, but in the end, they found themselves alone atop the NFC thanks to a win. Does this performance concern you, though? If it does, I don't think you're crazy. Blue 58! Hello and welcome to another episode of Blue 58, the one and only podcast of thepowersweep.com. I'm your host, John Meerdink. Very happy to be with you here for another episode. Quick reminder before we talk about the Packers' win over the Baltimore Ravens, our charity drive continues. Details are at thepowersweep.com and in your show notes to this episode, but we have recently cracked the $1,000 threshold. So excellent work, everybody who has donated so far. If you haven't, there's still plenty of time. You've got till December 31st to get your donation in if you'd like to be included in this year's um, charity drawing. Got a chance for one of seven prizes, all of which... We'll have Packers gear headed your way. So the Packers win 31-30 to over the Baltimore Ravens. And I closed my preview of this game by saying I thought, in short, the Packers were going to win but not cover. My reasoning was this, if you don't recall or if you're just tuning in for the first time. Quite often you don't really know what you're going to get from a really beat-up team. Figured that the Ravens were very hurt, but that always that isn't always an advantage because... An injured team is often very desperate. An injured team often can do things that you're not expecting because they've got different people in different roles and things like that. And it's not always a guaranteed thing that you're just going to come in and roll over the team that's super beat up. Now, that was half right, I think. The Ravens are really beat up. But it wasn't like they were coming out and doing a lot of things that really should have taken the Packers off guard. The Packers should have more or less known exactly what the Ravens were going to do. It really wasn't a surprise. And to that point, the Ravens didn't even really have to change their attack all that much to do what the Packers have been increasingly vulnerable to, power running and throwing to tight ends. That's kind of been the book on the Packers here for a couple of years now. Fewer teams have been able to do it this year, but they have been vulnerable to you know, power running, if you can stick with it, and attacking with tight ends. You add in the Packers shooting themselves in the foot on special teams, and you got a recipe for sticking around if you're the Ravens. But even as the Packers got their stuff together, they couldn't put the Ravens away. Packers were up 11 with under 13 minutes to go in the fourth quarter, yet here we are with less than a minute to go in the game with the Ravens at two-point conversions away from the lead. It was concerning. And yet, the Packers did not allow that two-point conversion. They stopped Mark Andrews for seemingly the first time all night. They got the win, and now they are all alone, technically, on top of the NFC. And we could stop there, and I think you could hand hand wave away things that are not going well if the Packers win. As I have said numerous times this season, there there are no style points in the box score, right? And if that is how you want to approach this game, I'm not going to say that you're wrong. If you just want to say, yep, the Packers got a win, they are in the driver's seat for the number one scene in the NFC, we shouldn't look too much past what was going on in this game. Really shouldn't worry about it. I'm not really going to say you're wrong if that's what you want to do. But parts of this game are going to stick with me. Running the ball and controlling the clock. Sticking with the Packers as the Packers continue to move their offense at a relatively slow slow pace. Attacking the Packers' defense with a good tight end if you got one. There are teams in the NFC that can do that and do that well. Philadelphia has done it well this season. San Francisco has done it well at times this season. The Packers controlled them pretty well earlier this season. And you know, of course, who does it best of all? Tampa Bay. Unless they're playing the New Orleans Saints. So if you come out of this game concerned, I really can't blame you there either. You might be right to be. Now, granted, the Packers were missing one crucial piece in this game. Kenny Clark might have had something to say about the the power running of the middle, at least. He can't contain Tyler Huntley on the outside, but he could have at least slowed things down a bit up the middle. Granted, on top of that, the Packers are probably going to be getting two big pieces back here in the near future. David Bakhtiari and Jair Alexander. I'm not entirely sure how they shape this game. But... If you are concerned about the Packers after this game, I don't think that's crazy. And I don't think you will find yourself alone in whatever corners of the Packers internet 
you hang out on this week. But let's talk about some good things that came out of this game. All of them are going to be on the offense today, uh, but I don't think that should be that big of a surprise. The first one I want to talk about is Marquez Valdez-Scantling. Doesn't seem like a stretch to say this was his best game of the season. Five catches, 98 yards, and a score. He had more yards versus Minnesota. Most of that came on one play. Tonight, today, whatever you want to say the time is for an afternoon game, it's all messed up because when I'm sitting at home watching this game, it's 5 o'clock and it's pitch dark out. I mean, that's a night game to me in my mind. Whatever time of day this game took place during, MVS was making plays. He was getting down the field, getting down the field consistently, doing it in different kinds of routes. He also had what is probably his most technically precise touchdown of the year. Nice little slant route down in the red zone. Uh, catches the ball away from his body, never really brings it in, and then extends for the goal line, scores the touchdown. Great to see. In addition, I think it was really good to see Aaron Jones getting healthy. I have more to say about the run game later. Much of it not super great. But speaking about Aaron Jones specifically, I think he looks healthier than he has been in some time, even prior to his MCL injury. His legs look fresh. He looked active in the run game, active in the pass game. He just showed the kind of versatility that we we haven't seen from him in a while. I don't know if it was overwork this season or what, but he looks fresher now than he has in quite some time. At least he did against the Ravens today. So good to see him trending in the right direction as the Packers look to add weapons down the stretch. Finally, speaking of weapons, tight ends. All right, maybe a little hyperbole there, but they combined Mercedes Lewis, Josiah DeGora, and Tyler Davis for seven catches for 76 yards. And considering that those three tight ends together probably wouldn't start by themselves for any team in the league, at least as a outside of a specific role, Mercedes Lewis is technically the Packers, you know, starting tight end uh, because of how they use him. But in terms of overall performance, I don't know if you'd really pencil any, any of those guys in for a, a big role on most teams in the league. Still, combining for seven catches for 76 yards, doing it in a variety of ways, I mean... That's a pretty good day at the office. And can we please get Mercedes Lewis a touchdown? That's all I ask for the remainder of the season. Well, I mean, and locking up the top seed, the NFC. But still, let's get Mercedes Lewis a touchdown. It is so apparent that the Packers obviously just want to get him in the end zone. They're doing everything they can to make it happen. Let's make it happen. So that's the good stuff. The bad stuff is a little bit more complicated. We, of course, have to start with special teams. It's to the point where you wonder if they're holding tryouts at kick returner, and maybe that's not all that bad of an idea, but we saw Amari Rogers back there, who had a big return called back. We had, saw Malik Taylor back there, who saw a short return end with him getting absolutely tattooed to the point that a Ravens player lost their hand warmer, hitting him so hard. And then we saw Patrick Taylor back there attempting to return a kick that the Ravens turned into some sort of um, like pooch kickoff situation. They had all kinds of trouble. Uh, corralling that one between Taylor and Jonathan Garvin. Not great. We also saw Isaac Yadam absolutely blow up Ravens punt returner, uh, gesturing towards the sideline as though he was blocked into the returner. He was maybe nudged slightly in that direction, but uh, I guess he figured he'd get his money's worth while he was headed that way, so he just blasted him with, with everything he had, and he can't do that. And then we have Corey Bajorka shanking a key punt to set up the potential Baltimore game-winning drive. We don't need to go much deeper than that, but special teams, again, pretty abhorrent. And I don't even know if I got everything. Surely there had to be something else out there. But those three things were bad enough. More broadly, it was really bad how surprised the Packers seemed by the obvious things that the the Ravens were going to do on offense. We've talked, or we talked, I guess, we can say it past tense, for quite some time about Mike Pettin's defenses being surprised by the obvious. The emblematic example was the Packers' loss to the Vikings at Lambeau Field last season. What do the Vikings like to do? They like to run outside zone. They like to run play action off of that. They like to throw to tight ends. What did they do? to beat the Packers. They ran a lot of Dalvin Cook in outside zone. 
They ran play action with Kirk Cousins, and they threw to their tight ends. What does Baltimore do? We mentioned one specific thing about their offense outside of Lamar Jackson in the preview. They have a pretty limited passing game. They throw to Marquise Brown, and they throw to Mark Andrews. And guess what they did today? You got it. 28 targets to Marquise Brown and Mark Andrews combined. With Sammy Watkins out, that's all they were ever going to do in the passing game. Rashad Bateman has a small role. Devin Duvernay has a small role. The bulk of the passing game goes through Brown and Andrews. Now, those targets that went towards Marquise Brown didn't go for much. His long for the night was seven yards, so they kept him under wraps pretty well. But the plan for Mark Andrews did not work, and the Packers did not seem to change that plan all that much. It became very obvious very quickly that trying to guard Mr. Andrews one-on-one wasn't going to work. Darnell Savage just could not do it. And to an extent, that is understandable. Mark Andrews is a great tight end. He's having a great season. A lot of people have failed to guard him. Okay? But the Packers didn't really seem to adapt to what was going on on the field. And it nearly cost them. Now, I'll say this. In fairness... I'm not sure what they could have really changed to. I don't want to be play-calling guy. There's only so much you can observe from the couch anyway. But short of going to something zone-based, I'm not sure anybody else fares better than Darnell Savage. And maybe going with the zone is is what you want there. Maybe that slows down Andrews. But if you want to play man-to-man, I'm not sure anybody does better than Savage did. Adrian Amos seems like he'd probably have gotten eaten up by Andrews' speed. Devondre Campbell, probably much the same problem. And beyond those two guys, I mean, who else are you going to put on a big tight end working the middle of the field? You're not going to put a corner over there. I guess if Jair Alexander was around and you were playing him in the slot, that might be an option. But you're giving up quite a bit of size there too, so I'm not really sure what the options really were. Ultimately, the Packers really failed to prevent the big plays from Andrews on a play-to-play basis. He wasn't just tearing him up down the field, but Savage mistimes his break on the ball on the Ravens' first drive, and suddenly Andrews is stampeding down the sideline. Savage is the victim of an admittedly uncalled push-off, and Andrews is scoring a touchdown. Savage fails to track the ball in the air, and Andrews scores another touchdown. I mean, a couple of those plays go slightly differently, and the stat line looks much different for Andrews, sure. But the plan was for Savage to take him one-on-one, and Savage didn't get it done. That's the problem. Finally, I'd like to talk a little bit about the Packers' running game. It seemed like the Packers have taken great pains over the years, over the, the, the Matt LaFleur era, to argue the point that they are actually a running team. And it's just not true. The Packers are a passing team. They pass to set up the pass. That is how their offense works. Their passing offense is based in a system where a lot of their passes look like runs at times. But they are a passing team. In neutral situations, they pass more than they run. In all situations, they pass more than they run. And they should because Aaron Rodgers is the most efficient quarterback in the league this year. He's producing the most by EPA. The Packers have weapons in the passing game of plenty. They have a great passing offense. But tonight, today, whenever, the Packers seem determined to show that they are a running team and that they are a balanced team and that they will run the ball whether it's working or not. Well, that seems like a really odd thing to do against a defense that really does just one thing well, and that one thing is stop the run game. Why throw yourself at the teeth of their defense if you don't have to, especially when other parts of that defense are just absolutely beat to heck? The only argument that really squares it for me is crowd noise, because it really seems to have been a factor. And if you want to say, okay, the run game is a way where we can take the crowd out of it a little bit, okay, that sure, I get that. But it seemed like the Packers were ending up in a lot of third down situations, third and medium situations where where the running game was off the table. 
that they could have otherwise avoided if they just tried some more efficient passes on first down. And I'm not talking about shots down the field. Aaron Rodgers, again, a little bit off on a couple deep shots today. The miss to Devontae Adams on their first drive and the miss to Alan Lazard on their final drive in the corner, their final real drive in the corner, uh, in the real drive, I suppose, um, prior to the three and out. Other than that, though, Rodgers was pretty sharp, even considering what the Packers had going on up front. It was, there were opportunities to pass there. And the Packers seemed to pass on a lot of opportunities when they could have thrown the ball against a very depleted secondary to just try to run directly at where the Ravens were strongest. A little bit mystifying. But the Packers prevail. They come out on top, 31-30. to So what does it mean? Well, first and foremost, it means that the Packers are NFC North champions. Been waiting for a long time to use that sound effect. One of my favorites. Uh, But yes, the Packers are NFC North champions. And more than that, the Packers are the top seed in the NFC. The bad news is, and I do not have a sound effect for this, the Packers can't rest. They do control their own destiny, but they need to keep winning to stay in control. Tampa Bay lost today. Arizona lost today. But the Dallas Cowboys are bearing down on the Packers. The Packers need Dallas to lose. Because it looks like if they end up finishing with the same record, Dallas actually holds the conference tiebreaker. Still, the Packers, if they continue to win, are in the driver's seat. And I just don't want to lose to the Dallas Cowboys. So if we can get the the Cowboys up in Green Bay, I think that's that's so much better. Uh, not that I'm overly concerned about heading down to Jerry World, but... There's just something about the idea of playing Mike McCarthy when he's at home in the playoffs that freaks me out a little bit. I don't know why. And the possibility of losing to Mike McCarthy, and I guess to a a greater extent Jerry Jones in the playoffs, just fills me with dread near equal to losing to Tom Brady, just for the gag-inducing takes that we'll see from that. As an aside, I was listening to a podcast today, which I will not drag through the mud, though it's a big national podcast, so what do they care? But their take going into week 15 was, what else does Tom Brady need to do to prove to you that he is the MVP of the league in 2021? I don't know. Like, be the best quarterback in his own conference? Slice it any way you like. Tom Brady has not been better over the long haul than Aaron Rodgers or Kyler Murray or even Matthew Stafford. He's putting up numbers pretty comparable to what Jameis Winston did in his final season in in Tampa, other than the interceptions. And he's doing it throwing to probably the best receiver group in the NFL behind an offensive line that's been completely intact all year. Oh yeah, and he's got a great defense backing him up. I mean, if that's your MVP, okay. But just admit that you're always just going to vote for Tom Brady anyway. I don't really care who wins the MVP, but don't just act like it's a foregone conclusion that it's going to be Brady. All right. Up next for the Packers, they've got the Browns at Lambeau Field on Christmas. Merry Christmas to you. It's an afternoon kickoff. 3.30 if you're at Central Time. 4.30 if you're on East Coast Time like I am. Uh, Hope you get your presents out of the way. And hopefully one of the presents we are unwrapping on Christmas is a return to the lineup for David Bakhtiari. And maybe Jair Alexander. And maybe both. It's a possibility. Maybe not a big possibility. But there is a non-zero chance that we're going to see them in the lineup in the very near future. And of course... It is the rare Saturday game, too, as well. A couple of random observations, and then we will let you get on with your Monday whenever you happen to be listening to this. Uh, the Packers have indeed won the NFC North. It is their third consecutive NFC North title. This is their third different winning streak of at least three consecutive NFC North titles since that division became a thing in 2002. They remain the only team that has won it more than twice in a row, and the Detroit Lions still have yet to win it. Secondly, en route to that NFC North title, Aaron Rodgers has now tied Brett Favre for the Packers' career lead in touchdown passes through three of them tonight. One to Devontae Adams, one to Aaron Jones, and one to MVS. Solid day at the offense, and now he gets a chance to break that record next week 
at Lambeau Field. Merry Christmas to Aaron Rodgers. Speaking of Aaron Jones, he has now scored double-digit total touchdowns for the third consecutive year. Still working to confirm if that is, in fact, good. Early indications it is that it is, in fact, a really good thing. Um, Being facetious there, of course. But uh, amidst everything he's gone through this year, great to see him reach that plateau again. In more small-time player news, Tyler Davis, the, I don't even know what string of tight end he would be at this point. If Tunyon was one, Lewis was two, DeGuar is three, Daphne was four, you're probably looking at the number five tight end for the Packers there. Uh, Whatever the case may be, he had a 22-yard catch today. That is the longest he has had as an NFL player and the longest he's had since he was a grad transfer at Georgia Tech in 2019. A continued welcome to the NFL for you. Mr. Davis. Had an odd situation on kick return. No, not the situation you might think. Uh, Just something statistically odd. Uh, Because he was back on the safety return when the Packers thought the the Ravens may be going with an onside kick, Aaron Jones logged a kick return in this game. And since he recovered an onside kick, A.J. Dillon also logged a return today. And since he was back on the pooch kick that the Ravens did, Patrick Taylor had a chance to return a kick as well, which would have meant that all three of the Packers' active running backs would have had a kick return in the same game. And I mention that because I just don't know if that's ever happened before. We came very close to an interesting statistical nugget. On the defensive side of things, Eric Stokes recorded his 13th pass defense of the season today. He is just the fourth rookie defensive back for the Packers to have done that since 1999, since that became an official statistic. He currently has the fourth most uh, of any defensive back, any rookie defensive back for the Packers. Casey Hayward in his rookie season logged 20. Mike McKenzie had 18 in his rookie year. Demarius Randall had 14. I think Stokes is going to pass that figure. And Jair Alexander had 11. So Stokes is ahead of his defensive backfield running mate. Dean Lowry also getting into the act there, too, had his third pass defense of the season. That is the third time in his career that he has had at least three in a season. Let's close on a good special teams note. Mason Crosby was one for one on field goals today. He was one for one on field goals last week, which means that he has gone without a miss in consecutive games for the first time since weeks three and four of the 2021 season. It's been a while, but Crosby is getting things together, and he has now made five of his last six field goal attempts. Not too bad. At least he is pointed in the right direction, it seems. So I've got for you in this episode, continue to donate, if you haven't yet, to our charity drive. We are looking for any and all donors of any dollar amount Uh, to contribute to uh, the Adrian Amos I'm Still Here Foundation or the Shamar Jean Charles team for the Walk to End Alzheimer's. Details are in your show notes. If you don't care to do that, that's fine. Uh, We would just ask that you continue to support Blue 58 by sharing this with someone you think would enjoy it. If you enjoy it, chances are somebody you know would enjoy it too, and that is going to help more people find the show and get involved in this conversation that you and I and everybody else are having about the Green Bay Packers, which in turn is going to help all of us, me included, become smarter Packers fans. And as I always say, smarter Packers fans are better Packers fans, and better Packers fans are what we all want to be. I'm your host, John Meerdink. We'll see you next time on Blue 58.